Alright church, good to see you all this morning. Welcome to Rice's Valley Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. Let's grab our blue hymnal. We'll begin the service today by turning to page number 352. Let's stand together if you're able. If you're not, just remain comfortable. All three stanzas as we begin the Lord's Day service. Look and live. Amen. The message from the Lord, hallelujah, the message unto you I give. Tis recorded in His Word, hallelujah, it is only that you look and live. Look and live, or will you live? Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in His Word, hallelujah. You look and live. I've a message full of love, hallelujah. A message from the Lord for you. Tis a message from above, hallelujah. Jesus said it, and I know it is true. Look and live, or will you live? Look to Jesus now and Recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. What is offered unto you, hallelujah. Eternal life your soul shall have. If you only look to him, hallelujah. Look to Jesus who alone can save. Look and live, but will you? now and live tis recorded in his word hallelujah it is only that you look and live yes hope you've got your spiritual eyes this morning and you look to God amen we need to look unto him who alone can save the Bible says look unto me and be ye saved for I'm God and there's none else Amen. We, we're looking in the right direction if we're looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's a blessing to be in church this morning. We're glad that you're here. Let's ask God's blessings upon the service. Brother Buddy, would you please take us to the throne of grace? Yes. Help us, God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. 545. 545. Bring them in. Amen. That's always good. Jesus, 
Out in the desert hear their cry Out on the mountains wild and high Arctis the Savior speaks to thee Go find my sheep where'er they be of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Please stand with me if you're able and turn to page 566. Page 566. We'll sing all three verses of When the Roll is Caught Up Yonder. If the roll is caught up yonder, we be there today. Page 566. shall sound and time shall be no more when the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the servant earth will gather over on the other shore and the roll is caught up yonder I'll be there when the roll is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder yonder I'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise in the glory of his resurrection chair when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is caught up yonder I'll be there when the roll is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun let us talk of all this wondrous love and care then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done and the roll is caught up yonder I'll be there when the roll caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder when the roll is caught up yonder I'll be there yes. amen amen thank you church you may be seated Never shall forget the day when my name was put on the roll, 30th of December, 1979. God saved this old sinner. And boy, I'm looking forward to him calling me home. Amen. Brother Brown was teaching us about it in Sunday school. What a blessing that was just to sit under the good word of God, how it helps his church. I've never seen the word of God hurt anybody, but it always helps. Even when you're not feeling at your best, it still helps you. What a blessing that is. All right. Well, I do want to thank the church for turning out yesterday. You made a believer out of me. Amen. You helped me. We got a lot done. Miss Jess said we had 22 people. Did you get down and pick people up that were standing on the road saying they would work for food? I don't know if I knew you all. I never. <laughs> Amen. But uh, I, owe hap I owe many of you a happy meal. I guess I do. But we did get a lot done. And it really, you can tell. I mean, the church looks good. And I thank you for all the help there. And uh, we got some work done on the roof on some gutter guards and that was such a big deal and we had a good rain and you know how that gutter guard and that gutters and it's been a difficulty for me over the years and you pray that God will help us fix that can God seal a gutter problem can God fix it he can use somebody to help to get it fixed can he well anyhow we thank the Lord for that we praise the Lord for that Miss Faye asked us to pray for her sister she's uh, in Tupelo and she's got a lot of kidney trouble and cancer, and she had to go over there and try and take care of her, her sister. So please remember Miss Faye. And then, of course, her husband's still not at his best. He's been sick for a while. And then I could go over the prayer list and would never get to preaching. It's full, always. But we're glad that you're here today. Good to see John back after knee surgery. Praise the Lord for that. We missed you. Glad that you're doing well. Amen. Our Bible conference starts next Friday night, it's here. 
All I can encourage you to do is be here. Amen. We want you to get a blessing. We want it to help you. It's not uh, a showtime. It's not a performance. It's not, it's not celebrity time. It's God time. And I promise you, dear church, if we'll come with that mindset, God will speak to us. He'll use these men that are coming to minister to us, these songs to encourage us. Got three of the best pastors, I'm convinced. Just a great lineup. Excited about them coming. Starts on Friday night at 6 o'clock. We'll have two preachers and singing. And as I've said, if you're not at your best and you need to just sit for one and you need to re retire, I get it. It's okay. Just get what you can. Get what you can. Saturday morning is at 9 o'clock. And we have three preachers that morning plus a bunch of singing. And I uh, want you to be here all you can. Sa Saturday night, 6 o'clock, two preachers. And then Sunday morning we have something that we've never done in a long time. We're going to have a singing. And Brother Sound Doctrine will be here for Sunday school. And they'll sing for about 40 minutes. And then we'll have our main preaching service. And we're having a dinner on the grounds on Saturday morning. And then dinner on the ground Sunday morning. So it's just got a good variety of opportunities to be blessed and enjoy God's people. And uh, so you bring them in, like the song said a little while ago. Bring them in. Bring a friend. Bring a lost, if you've got a lost loved one, oh, bring them in. Bring them in. And uh, if you need stirred, bring them in. Come on. Come on. Let's try to do our best to, to just honor the Lord and just get some help. But they don't last long enough. Our Bible conference seemed like you get here. You work so long to have it, and then we have it, and phew, boy, it seems like it just goes on fast track, and it's over. So let's, uh, let's not let that happen. Let's just enjoy it, and I sure do appreciate it. Ushers, if you'll come, please. Good to have Brother Murphy and his dear wife with us all the way from Boise, Idaho. Amen. And he's a good guy. He's an Alabama fan. Amen. I, I rent I rent him. Uh, uh, about 30 years ago when I was his pastor up in Gadsden, Alabama, and he came over to my house, watched a Michigan-Alabama game, and he's been rent ever since. Whatever rent is, amen? But Stephen, you and your dear wife, we're so glad you're with us. He's going to be preaching for us Wednesday week and be with us all during our conference. He's staying in our prophet's chamber, so you make yourself known to Brother Stephen and his dear wife, Stephanie, and we're glad that they're with us. Amen, church? Amen. amen. Brother Doug, ask God's blessing on the offering, please. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this privilege you give us this morning to be in your house. Lord, we thank you for the Sunday school hour and the blessing there, and thank you for all our Sunday school teachers. Lord, we thank you for our little kids, Lord. I pray that you bless us, Lord. Keep us close to you, Lord, and keep them in your way, Lord. Please that. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you bestowed upon this church. I only give you how good you've been to us. Lord, we just thank you for all that you do for us. And we're privileged to be able to give back to all fortune that you bless us with. I pray, Lord God, that it be you in a way to honor and glorify your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
turn to page 528, page 528. Do you really want revival? Page 528. I really want God's power and I really want His Spirit to control my life this hour Oh, I'm looking now to Jesus I will seek His face and pray Yes! For I really Amen, brother. Good job. Thank you. Oh, how we need revival, church. We need stirred, don't we, church? We do. Let me just, don't mean to take this in a different direction. We had a deacons meeting Wednesday night. Good meeting. Appreciate the opportunity to get there. And uh, they brought to my attention the mission given last year. $60,000 to missions last year. Wasn't that a blessing? Oh, folks, thank you for giving for missions. Thank you for doing that. What a blessing. Ah, it's just incredible. A real blessing. And also want to brag on my dear wife. No, she doesn't want attention, but she, she's put over 21, nearly 20, 20, 20 years and six months uh, working in the, pub, in the public school system in the cafeteria, and she retires tomorrow. Glory to God. Yeah, she, and you don't do that when I preach. I don't have a bone to pick with her. Amen. She only does that when Alabama wins and she retires. Amen. Maybe I need to retire. I don't know. But anyhow, I love my dear wife. and Thank God for her today. All right. Uh, Psalms chapter number uh, 84 and Acts chapter 28, please. Acts chapter 28 and Psalm 84. What a blessing help she's been over the years as a pastor and helping the church. We just thank the Lord for that. We really do. Can't brag on my dear wife enough. Love her dearly. She is a blessing and a help to this preacher. Psalm 84, just one thought to take us to our main text. It says in verse 6, you ought to have it marked in your Bible. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Now, I'm sure we could sit around this morning and I could mully grub and say why God won't. Uh, we could look at the state of the nation. We could look at the morality. We could look at the, the, all the new culture problems. Psalm 85, verse 6. I think I said 84. Psalm 85, verse 6. And, and the question is, wilt thou, can God do it? Can God revive us? Well, that's the question. Many people want to 
A lot of people say America has gone too far, and I'm convinced America is in a bad place. I'm convinced it's joining the graveyard of all the other nations that have attempted to live for God. It's not in its best place. And part of that may be very well prophecy regarding the law of the harvest regarding America's decline and departure from God. But the psalmist still said, Wilt thou not revive us again as if God can? I, I want to believe. Why, ha why come to church? Why read your Bible? Why believe God's still able to stir us a little bit? What is revival? You know, the natural man, humanly speaking, says, totally impossible. Man, we're dead as four o'clock. Man, we ain't got no fire in us. We ain't got no spirit in us. We, well, we've got the spirit of God, but we're just not zealous. We're, we're dry. We're dead. We're boring. And all of that, we have to say, yeah, boy, that describes me, the preacher. And you think about spiritual help. Spiritual help comes from the Lord. God loves to stir those that are His. Amen. You can't get revival from the world. You can't get revival from the flesh. It requires supernatural help. And boy, He says, if He does, that thy people <coughs> may rejoice in thee. I'd sure love to see that smile return to God's people in their heart. I'd like to see God's people, you know, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. I'd like to see God's people get some help from the Lord. And he's able and willing. I'm convinced he is. What would a revival be? It'd be like having a little touch of God on your life that you know God's doing what, something supernatural in you. Well, that wind blows from another country and, you, and you're in a place where God's stirring the hearts. It, it, it's, it's the zeal of thine house eats you up. That's what the Bible says. I mean, you just get in church and you just can't get enough of it. It, it. it restores that first love, first joy where you're excited about the songs, the people, the, 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 the purpose. I mean, it's just when the fire falls and and it kind of sets your soul on fire. Nah, it only happens in supernatural sense. That's why we sing, do you really want revival? Can God stir his people? I believe he can. I believe spiritual renewal is available tonight. It may come in the fact of rededication. It may come in humility. It, it, it may come in regards to confession of sins. It, it, it may we just humble ourselves. He'll lift us up. I mean, uh, we need a burden. We need to be, uh, uh, in days gone by, they called revival a great awakening. In other words, the, the church, the saints of God had fallen into slumber. And they needed to be spiritually awoke. They needed a little shaking. Amen. I love that. Oh, I'm convinced that the body of Christ could use a stirring in this time of apostasy. And I believe God's still able to show people, uh, I'm not done yet. I, I don't know that we'll see a national revival. I don't, I don't foresee that because of all that takes place. But I'm not God. Uh, I mean, Jonah, Jonah had one. And, and Nineveh didn't deserve it. Amen. Uh, and I'm not saying we're Nineveh, but I'm just saying, folks, uh, we need a burden to, to be uh, hot for God. We're cold enough. Oh, God forgive us for being cold. Uh, we need that. I guess the, the greatest love in our life should be our first love. Our first love for God. We could study Ephesus. We need that fellowship where it's sweet. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Amen. Uh, the preacher needs anointing. You need to pray for God to use an unworthy preacher to be able to preach the sacred, blessed word of God. Amen. We need that touch where the, the pulpit uh, is, is alive and it's hot. We need that. We need conviction. God's people need to know that sin will not be tolerated by God. He'll crucify it. He'll kneel it. He'll reveal it. He wants us to confess it and forsake it. He does. I love the thought in Philippians. It says that in all things he might have the preeminence. He, he, he will not compete. He is not ex second best is not good for God. He, he, he demands to be first. And by the way, he deserves to be first. He does. 
Oh. And the condition, of course, is found in Second Chronicles, the, the, the famous text. It says, if my people, which, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. Uh, we got to pray. God, wilt thou not revive us again? God, would you do it today? Would you help us today? Would you, would you speak to us today? Would you stir us today? Would you draw near to us today? I, I, I'd like that. I'd like that. Oh, I tell you, if we'll draw nigh to God and confess our sins and repent, I believe God can do his part. I believe he can restore unto us the joy. Just be glad you're, you know what people say, how you doing? I, I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Not can, I'm not fond of some of my circumstances, but I'm glad I'm saved. Amen. Ah. Oh. You start thinking about revival. How, how, how does that happen? Turn with me to Acts chapter number 27, please. Acts chapter 27. We have a story here that I love to address at revival time. And it's been, be surprised how many years it's been since I, I brought this thought to the attention of our church preceding our Bible conference. It's been five or six years, and I just felt like we needed to revisit this thought. Acts chapter 27, and, and we'll uh, pick it up in verse number, well, we'll start in verse 40, chapter 27. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea, and loosing the rudder bands, and hoising up, the men sailed to the wind, and made towards shore, and falling into a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the four parts stuck fast, Remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. And the soldiers' counsel was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, thank God this man had a burden for a preacher. Amen. Willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And here's the reference in the Bible on mission boards. And the rest, some on boards, amen. And some on broken pieces of ship. And so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to land. And when they were escaped, man, I can't imagine having a shipwreck like this. Can't imagine. I've been to the Mediterranean when I was a kid. It's a lot of water out there. Kind of like the Gulf. There's a lot of water out there. And the only part of the Gulf I like to be on, if I'm not on a boat, is when my feet are on the ground. I don't like to be out in that water when there's stuff, nothing underneath me. But to, get, to be in a shipwreck, oh, it's a terrible thought. Terrible thought. It says when they were escaped, these folks escaped a shipwreck. Then they knew that they were in the island which is called Melita. And here's the story. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire. And received us, every one, because of the present rain. And here's the thought, because of the cold. You think about circumstances that take place when people experience a disaster like this. The Apostle Paul is, is no spring chicken. He's headed to Rome, as we all are, metaphorically. We're headed to Rome. This world's headed to Rome uh, because of apostasy and, and what takes place Proceeding and during the tribulation. The Apostle Paul, he's, you think when you get a little older, things get easier, but that's not the case. That's not the case. Life doesn't lighten up. Burdens seem to increase as you get up in years. And Paul, he, he hasn't received his AARP card. They didn't have him back then. He wasn't, he, he wasn't on the love boat and he wasn't on the carnival cruise. He was on a convict ship headed to Rome. You think, Oh, what a sad way to end your life. Well, he was, he'd already been to heaven, and he was ready to go at any moment. So he didn't, have a, he didn't have a death wish, but he knew heaven was coming. And we see him engulfed in this storm. Those of you, Brother Stephen doesn't know, the greatest meteorologist in Alabama is a man by the name of James Spann. He's just, we trust him, we do. And uh, whenever there's a storm, we look to him. And uh, they called this storm Euryclid, and he's always naming storms and telling us about storms. In verse number 14 of chapter 27, this was a bad storm. Uh, who wants to be in the middle of a storm? I don't know anybody that wants to be in a storm, 
that potentially ends in shipwreck, where it's man overboard, every man for himself. That's not what you want to hear, is it? That's what they heard. And that's not good. This aged preacher, he, he, was, he was well familiar with those words. He had heard them multiple times. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians, when he gives his brief biography, he says, thrice I suffered shipwreck. Well, if I'd have been the apostle, Paul said, can we not go another way? I'd, I'd be a little gun shy getting on any boat, wouldn't you? But boy, I'm telling you what, folks, there's a lot of things out there. A lot of people have been in multiple car wrecks and you have to get back in them. It's a means in which we get around. And I, I do believe we need to be careful when we're in them automobiles, don't you, church? God help us. Everybody's so distracted. The thought that the Apostle Paul says in his testimony, he says, in journeys oft, in perils of waters, perils of robbers, he gives a, a description of his life, and it's just a, it's a wreck. It's not smooth sailing, it's difficult. When we get saved, we hope things are going to be a little more smooth, and, and they are spiritually. I mean, there's peace. You've got that peace of God. You know it's well with your soul. You know when Jesus comes, you're part of the bride. You're leaving town. But boy, this whole world, it's just a man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of troubles. And no one likes that. None of us enjoy that. Anybody that does, there's something wrong with their head. Amen. Nobody likes that. He says, in robbers, uh, in perils of robbers, he had been robbed in perils of mine own countrymen. He said, my own people were against me. In perils of the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils of false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings oft, in hunger, in thirst, in fasting often. And this is what I want to get your thought. He said, in cold and nakedness. Now, now we're spoiled here in Alabama. We, we don't have the kind of weather... Brother Stephen has up there in Boise, Idaho. I mean, it's probably snow on the ground, fries, uh, ice, all just kind of terrible stuff, terrible stuff. Came down here at a good time of the year. Hopefully we won't see any of that, amen? But nobody enjoys being cold. But can you imagine being in a storm where you're in the water and you find yourself on land and you've just got out of a shipwreck that's a near-death experience and you're overwhelmed with cold? You're not at your best. Your circumstances seem broke. You're not in control. You're not able to just say, where's the heat at? There was no heat. But they found themselves on this island, the Bible says, in the book of Acts chapter 28. And it says, the barbarous people, in verse number 2, showed us no little kindness. These folks that were enemies to the gospel, that did not know Christ, these folks that were possibly enemies to the Jews, everybody hated the Jews back in them days that wasn't a saved person. Even the Jews had problems with themselves. But what they did, in all the needs that the Apostle Paul had, and in all the needs the church has today, I, I, I could elaborate on all the different burdens and the problems and the troubles that's in the body of Christ, in the, in the family of God, in the house of God, and we could spend all day talking about all the things that are broke. Storms of life have a way of revealing our character, how we respond to storms. It does. Two great characters is, is Job. Job responded to storms by saying, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a spiritual response. We look at Job as such a great patriarch in difficulty. I remember young Michael saying that was his favorite book. I said, you're too young for that to be your favorite book. But it is. And we studied it a few years ago and attempted to try to connect the dots. I, I think of Jonah, another one. Jonah was an a disobedient servant of God who found himself in a storm created by God and he thrown overboard, and, and boy, because he, his response was negative. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. Sometimes we are the author of our storms. He ended up being, you know, swallowed by a whale. You know the story. 
But sometimes storms comes in people's lives and, and what it does, it reveals if we've got any character in order to be able to endure a little hardness. We need a little help in this culture today. I mean, one of the, the biggest storms that's happened in our world has been this COVID. Like it, believe it, whatever. That's not the argument today, but it has changed the world in which we live. Fear and broken down immune systems and circumstances on the economy. It's a storm. And God's people, how they respond. We ended up even closing churches because of the need for safety, which was the right thing to do with what information we had at the time. Still suffering from some of those circumstances. There's no doubt about it. But the Apostle Paul nearly drowned. Did you ever nearly drowned? I would hate to drown. I, I really would. I, I like to lie in a bathtub. That's about as deep a water I want to get. Amen. But the thought of drowning just, oh. You know when people come out of that ship, imagine their mindset. There was enormous need for help. And people needed somebody to respond to them. And of course, when you think about what they needed, uh, many of them needed medical attention. They're, some of them may have gotten hurt, cut, just and, go, and drunk a lot of water and needed that pumped out. I mean, the Bible says they all made it safe to land. But I'm sure they were a sight to behold. I, I, I promise you, they needed something to eat. I mean, that's always, when, when we have a disaster in Alabama or anywhere in the country, first thing you do, Red Cross tries to go in there and provide some food to try to help the civil, because they're not able to prepare food. But I'm convinced one of the most important things that they needed, just like we have urgent needs today that need our attention, I, I, I believe they needed a little heat. They needed somebody to kindle a fire that would help them be able to get back to a position where they could function better because they were just not able. They were, they were freezing. They were, they were overwhelmed with anxiety. They had fear and, and they needed somebody to kindle a fire. And of all people, it was the barbarians that kindled the fire. The enemy. People they didn't know. You know, a little kindness is universally accepted, isn't it? Everybody needs a little kindness, don't they, church? Aren't you glad when somebody's kind to you? Aren't you glad when God's kind to you? Amen. You think about this cold atmosphere. We're living in 2023. You have to agree with me, regardless of what part of the country you're from. We're living in a cold atmosphere spiritually. It requires a lot of effort a lot of prayer, a lot of pleading of the blood to get an atmosphere where it's conducive uh, to be warm and to be hot for God. The pulpit and the pew and in the hearts of God's people. It's a cold temperature today. Urgent need. What is the most urgent need in Alabama? What is the most urgent need in Boise, Idaho or Alabama or, or, or Mississippi or Georgia? I've had the privilege over the past 38 years since I've been out preaching. First revival I had was in 1984. That's a long time ago, 39 years ago. And not much has changed from Florida to Canada to, to Northwest to Paraguay to Mexico or wherever you want to go. Romania, I've been there. Everywhere I've, I've seen one urgent need among God's people that always brings back a good response. They need a little heat. They need a little warmth. They need a little fire. They need a little... It's cold and they need God to supernaturally warm the atmosphere. Make it warm. Make it hot. A little zeal about the things of God. If I was to ask for testimonies, what is your greatest need today? And I'm sure health-wise... Economic-wise, domestic-wise, no doubt, multiple. Urgent. But if there's one thing Rice's Valley needs tonight, this morning, next week, 
They need a supernatural visitation from God that will stir our hearts, that help us be hot for God. Hot for God. The Bible says, because iniquity abounds, the love of many shall wax cold. We, we have no argument there. We know some things going on today we never thought we'd see in our lifetime. And as a result of this social media and all that's involved with it, we don't want to say it's the only problem. The real true source of, of all our problems, of course, are unrighteousness and darkness and principalities and powers and the devil. We know that. But boy, it'd be a blessing this morning to see God's people have a little heat. The Bible says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. God would rather we admit that we're, we're hot or we're cold. Now, if you're hot, it's obvious. Other people are going to come around you and go, oh, like that heat. Oh, warm. Be a blessing if the pulpit was hot for God. Amen. Be a blessing if the preaching was hot. Many times, one of the most discouraging thing of trying to minister the Word of God is the lack of feeling hot or the lack of response from hot or a block of ice when you're preaching. Back in the days when they didn't have AC and the old preachers used to have a block of ice under the pulpit where they put their hands on it to keep them from hyperventilating, getting too hot. But that really helped them and they'd have their hanky and you'd, you'd see them do that and that was how they maintained the composure and the zeal to be able to finish but we're so blessed. We have thermostats. We have padded pews, lumbar seating, pad carpet. I mean, we're so blessed. But that don't mean we still don't need some heat from another country. We need stirred, folks. We need hot. Hot from God. This portion of Scripture here is interesting. You see the sense of urgency for somebody to kindle a fire for these people that have just come out of a, a storm. When people are hurting folks, you know what they need? They need somebody to make them feel warm. They need somebody to embrace them in prayer. They need somebody to love them. They need somebody to make them not feel cold. They don't need coldness. Oh, God forgive us. Sometimes our attitude is cold. And God forgive us that we would repent and help us have a spirit that would be warm towards even barbarians. They need God, folks. They need God. Oh, folks, be a blessing if the Bible was hot. This is a hot book, by the way. It's hot off the, say, the presses. It's like radiation, this book. It's just, when you read it, it just, it, it's alive. It'll stir you. It'll give life to the lost. It'll bring conviction to the saved. And, and it'll bring love for the Lord. It, it'll bring humility. It'll conf this is a hot book, folks, but sometimes... It's just another sermon, another message, another, another scripture. Boy, wouldn't it be a blessing if you're on the edge of our seat and the word of God's read and we're going, boy, that's so what we need. That's so right. That's just what God wants to say to us. Thank you, God, for the Bible. There's one book in all the world that can change all the world. There's no doubt this book can do it. It's a supernatural book, folks, and it needs to be read and loved and hid in our heart and preached by the good grace of God. It brings warmth. People to say, why are you having all these preachers? Why don't you just sing and eat? It's become popular just to sing and eat and drink coffee. Well, I'm not against you drinking coffee, and I'm not against you eating. And I'm not against you... What else did I say? Huh? Singing. singing. I'm not against you singing. Amen. But there's a lot of singing that doesn't warm the heart for God. A lot of church singing today is not very spiritual. As a matter of fact, it's very unspiritual. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that people say is entertaining. And I'm telling you what, it just kills and grieves God. And, and the flesh loves it. And everybody responds like the flesh does. And that's why it's so popular today for personalities and performers uh, and they promote you to respond in a way that's not spiritual. Good way to respond to good preaching is amen. Glory to God. Amen. Yes. Not this. Oh, he's so good. He's so nice. 
No, he's not very nice. And he's not very good. But if what he's saying brings glory to God, the Spirit of God's going to back that up with some heat. You're going to get on fire for God and be ready to receive the Word. Amen! There's an urgent need today for revival, folks. Paul and these men that were shipwrecked, they had an urgent need. What was it? They needed a little heat. I remember old-time preachers in days gone by, they used to say, that preacher's fired up. Where'd that saying go? When last time you went to church and heard a preacher fired up? Oh, God, give us some old country, uh, old paths, King James, uh, Bible preaching where they've got a little fire to them and they're zealous and their Bible's hot and the message is hot. Too many of them are just graveyard dead. Don't even believe what they're saying. That's why. I'm, I know I'm nuts, but let me be nuts by myself. We're not having speakers next week. I don't want anybody to speak. We're having preachers. Amen. Amen. That's a big deal to this preacher. Now the next generation, that's all gone. We're done. Everybody's in. Our next speaker, no, you can sit down. We don't want to hear a speaker. We want to hear a preacher. Amen. We want to hear singers, not talkers. I hate singers getting up here and they want to tell you their whole life every time they talk up as if it's so emotional. Shut up and sing. Amen. You say, that's not very nice. Well, I'm preaching, doing the best I can, and that's how I feel about it. Because I think it's so. Anyhow, oh, I tell you, when you start thinking about how to have revival, oh, John Wesley, that old Methodist preacher, Brother Brown was talking about old Methodists, and that's, today's Methodist is a lot different than the old-time Methodists. I was raised Methodist. I was, first time I went to church, they threw water around me and called me names, too. But it didn't save me. It didn't put me in the, it didn't put me in the covenant. But that's what they thought. Dear mother and all the rest, they didn't know. Old John Wesley was a great old preacher. He said, why, people asked him, why do so many people love to hear you preach? And John Wesley said, well, he said, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. I like that. Would to God we had more preachers that were hot for God in the pulpit telling people what God said and what people need to do in order to get some heat, in order to draw an eye to God, in order for God to revive us again. Amen, church? This old world is lost and on its way to a devil's hell. And I'm telling you, they, they don't need old, dead, dried up, cold Baptist churches. We've had enough of that. We fit into that category every once in a while. I'm to blame. I take it. God forgive me. Help me be a better preacher where I'm on fire for God. But I need revival. I need revival. Amen. That's right. Oh, folks. I tell you what, folks, they need to come to a place where there's a warm heart. People walk in these doors, they need to come to a place where the love of Christ is hot. Amen. They need to come to a place where it's Krispy Kreme hot. Now, Brother Scott, where's he at? You did good yesterday bringing donuts. You just brought the wrong kind. We need Krispy Kreme hot, the hot sign. Amen. I like that hot now business. Amen. <laughs> yeah, them other ones are good now. Don't get me wrong when you're in a pinch. But I like it when the pulpit's hot now. The sign's on. And by the way, that's what we should be praying for when we come to church. That God will bless and help the pulpit be hot for God. Not a political message. Not a meddling mess. Just Thus saith the Lord, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? There's not one person in this sanctuary this morning that doesn't need to be hot for God and need supernatural help from God. And God wants to. Oh, dear church. You ever try to kindle a fire? You ever tried to be a fire bug? Uh, uh, you, you guys, I remember being down in Pensacola and they'd get down on the the, the bridge that goes from uh, the mainland over to uh, the, the beach. And I have a big pier there where everybody fishes. And I'd never done it before. I went down there. I didn't do any fishing. I was just watching. I didn't have the fishing stuff. And they had these big old fires. I said, man, how in the world do you light a fire in the middle of this? They said, we got these big old logs. 
and you buy them at the store and you go in and just a little match and whoof. I said, man, somewhere. I never had one of them when I was growing up. That's a hot way to stay warm out there on that pier. When I grew up, we had a coal fire. And every once in a while, it was the preacher's job to light the fire about 5, 6 o'clock in the morning before everybody gets up so there's a little heat in the house. We didn't have one of them thermostats on the wall where everybody said, would you turn it up a little, preacher? And you bump it and everybody goes, "Ah." Oh. We didn't have one of them. You remember. Ah. Oh. We had, had to go down in the middle of the morning because it was my turn and I had to clean out a hearth. You ever clean out an old hearth with old ashes and stuff? Kind of like, it's a little bit like a barbecue but a little more messy. And you're down there. And by the way, it's cold. There's no radiators and there's no thermostat and there's no hot air. It's cold. This is the only source of heat. And you have to get down on your knees when you start lighting a coal fire. Some of you, and you have to clean all that mess out on your knees. And I'm just trying to tell you, if we're ever going to kindle a fire, somebody's going to have to get on their knees. And you clean that old mess out and, you, and you're dirty. We're all dirty. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And you get that old mess cleaned out, and then you, you're ready to start rebuilding a fire. You're starting to let, get things ready. It doesn't just happen because you clean the old mess out. You've got to clean it out, and then you've got to get some coal. And it, it could be wet. Did you ever try to light wet coal? It's not no fun. And you've got to get paper. We didn't have any of them whoof, businesses. We had to try and get a few sticks if you had it. And you go in there, and you start building the fire, and you get down there. If everybody's watching me back home in Ireland, you remember how we did this? They do, my sister. And you get down there and you and you put some paper, put some sticks, and then you'd place some you'd place some coal on there, and then you're cold, by the way. You ever been cold? And, and you strike a match, and it's a dud. <laughs> kind of like some of my sermons, most of my sermons, dud. It couldn't light nothing. And so you light that match, and it lights, and you're cold, and and you go under there, and you're down like. You know, this preaching stuff looks like it's easy, but there's a lot of work to it, you know. And, and the, you get down there and you light that piece of paper and you're hoping it's just going to go whoosh, because you need a draw from above to get that wind to just whoosh, and light that fire. And I'm going, please, Lord, you never prayed so much in all your life. God, please let it light. I, I want to go back to bed. Uh, and you know what happens? It kindles and nothing happens. So there you are. So what do you got to do? You got to take it all out again, start all over again. It's kind of like Sunday morning when I have to preach again. Amen? Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever it is. It, it, it doesn't always hit the mark. So you start again and say, all right, Lord, let me start again. Over on this side, they need it bad. Amen? You folks weren't listening. And so uh, you get in there and you get that paper and you get that sticks and you get that. And you prayed more this time. said, oh, God, we need heat. We're freezing. And you go, Whoosh. and, and it's good. Say, maybe so. Maybe today. And then it goes out. It does. It happens. And you're saying, I don't like this house. I hate this fire. Some people say that about church. They don't like this church. Don't like this preaching. It just keeps us under pressure to get right and to humble ourselves and pray and get down. You get in the third time, you go, Lord, please. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to light a fire. Mom and Daddy getting up. Got to go to work. And you get in under there and you light that fire. And you, whoo, whoo, all of a sudden it just goes, whoo, and you go, whoo, glory to God. I don't care if I'm dirty. I'm going back to bed anyhow. Amen. And that thing lights. And you know what happens? It starts to glow and it starts to warm. And mom and daddy come down. They don't think about all the work that went into trying to light a fire. They said, I'm glad you did what you're supposed to do. You, many of you need to do what you know you're supposed to do. But we say, ah, that's hard work. Kindling the fire is hard work, folks. Not everybody's on board. Amen. It's sad for sure. But what a blessing it is to get a fire lit, spiritual fire. What a blessing it would be today and Wednesday and next Friday, Saturday and Sunday and Monday, or whenever the meeting lasts, to see God just blow through here and just get underneath you and just go. And you just, like a spirit of God. Not that you're lost, but you just get a little renewal. You get a new refreshed. You feel like you're rededicated. You've fallen back in love with Christ. You love the book. You're thanked. You say, this whole time religion, I've been missing it. Amen. God begins to stir. Oh, how we need a stirring from God, folks. We do. We need a stirring. You know, most people think Alabama's so special, and it is. We've got a lot of special buses in Alabama. 
for a lot of people. I mean that in silly ways. You know, a survey was taken years ago on how spiritual Alabama is. It was embarrassing. This was a poll. I forget who done it. I've got a Christian poll uh, way back in 07. It's been many years ago. And they, say, they asked how, how the people, residents of Alabama were more Bible knowledgeable than any other state since 70% of the poll in Alabama, here's the question, could name the four Gospels. Wow. Big. That's not bragging rights right there. If you don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'm telling you what, you need to go to Sunday school. Amen. No family altar. That's bad. Huh? I'm convinced most Southerners know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and God. John because their, their history, they, they loved the Civil War. And during the Civil War, they had one general that named his four cannons, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they love that. Amen. I'll, I'll fire you up. Amen. That's carnal, but it's how they do it. Ah, oh, we're not spiritual because we can name four books in the Bible. That should embarrass us. Amen. We think because we've been in the Bible, but we have been, and we've been blessed. We've got a great heritage. We've got great, great family members and loved ones that sacrificed and humbled themselves in God and met with us. But I'm here to tell you, dear church, things have changed a lot in Alabama and all over the country. It's gotten cold. What would your response be to cold? What would you do? I think I'll just stay home. I, I just can't go to church. Brother Sam, he's just, he just loud. He just in your face. He just kind of wants us to respond. Duh. Is that not what I'm supposed to get you to do? I, I need you to say, Amen, that's right. The book's right. God's right. I need fired up. Amen. That doesn't have to be an age thing. I know some of you older dear saints of God have been busy in your youth and you've been active for years and now your body just won't work. But I'm telling you what, you can have a spirit of revival. You can be excited about the things of God. You can love the Lord. You can be an example to these youngins about somebody who still loves old time religion. Amen. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Oh, I tell you, we need... Get fired up. What are you fired up about tonight, this morning? What fire, what cranks your tractor? Huh? It's not Alabama football. When Cody's here next week, it'll be Georgia football. He is bound. And when he says something, boom. <laughs> hey, man. Cody Zorn shows up and he starts bragging on Georgia. Boo! I want you to do that. Would you do that for me? I'll, I'll pray God forgives me afterwards. Hey, Amen. And deacons, if you don't help me there, I'm going to be terribly disappointed. I want my deacons to get up and turn their back on them and something. Hey, man, we don't have such things in Rice's Valley Baptist Church. Hey, man, thank you, Brother Deacon. Uh, what is it that I enjoy football just like anybody else? Uh, Brother Brian does. He loves it. He loves that <clears throat> contact. Hey, man, what is it that makes you, <clears throat> picks you up, fires you up, stirs you up? Well, I'm, dear, I'm church, there's a lot of things in life that are not wrong to stir you up. I mean, there's nothing wrong with some of the things that we do in this world that give us pleasure. But would to God our heart was after God more than anything else. Amen. Would to God we were concerned about the church house reaching the next generation. We were burdened about moms and dads in their homes being strong for God. Would to God we were concerned about sustaining a Bible preaching ministry and continuing to evangelize and support our missionaries around the world and we're praying for one another. How we need to be fired up, church. How we do. Oh, but there's some problems that can come when you get fired up. You know what happens here? Look at this story. Look at Acts chapter 27. Oh, it's amazing here. Verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, he's adding, he's throwing fuel on the fire, and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Well, it's amazing. We know, we know what a viper is. It's, it's a venomous beast that can kill you. And nobody in here likes snakes. We don't handle snakes. We kill snakes. Amen. I remember we moved here 25 years ago. Sandy and I were driving to church and Brother Brown was behind us and, and we were coming down there one of the Mitlire Road and she swerved to hit a snake. And we got to church and said, now if you're ever going to be the pastor's wife this church needs you to be, you've got to run over snakes. Amen. She learned it, I thank Brother Brown. Amen. 
Now, we kill snakes around here. We don't handle them. Amen. Oh, I can't stand a snake. Oh, I can't stand a snake. I, I can't stand a slithering snake. And I can't stand a, handle a, a two-legged snake. Mm, some of them creep around and they're just spooky. And they need to be run over. Amen. Oh, the devil. The devil's a type of a snake. You know how that works in Genesis chapter 3. So this is a picture of somebody getting a fire started and all of a sudden opposition shows up. All of a sudden somebody gets bit by something. All of a sudden people find themselves oppressed or distracted or hurting. And they're saying, I don't know why in the world I'm supposed to be living for God. I don't know why this would happen to me. I'm, I'm doing right. I know you know this. But being saved doesn't have a, a hedge of a bubble around you where it protects the flesh from getting hurt. The only thing that protects your flesh from getting hurt is the rapture. When you get a new body and you'll be like Christ and it'll be wonderful. But it hasn't happened yet. It could happen today. I hope it does. What a revival that would be. You talk about Rice's Valley going up hot. Amen. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Oh, you start a fire, you start a fire, you kindle a fire and watch what happens. You're going to have opposition, folks. There's no doubt about it. That viper came out of the fire. My old Bible teacher used to say, the closer you get to God, the closer you're going to get to the devil. I, I can't believe that. In other words, it won't go unnoticed by your enemy. And they'll try to hinder you by not continuing you kindling a fire. Kindling a fire in prayer, kindling a fire in, in just charity, kindling a fire in, in just helping people, kindling a fire and doing right, kindling a fire and reading the book, being in church. You say, I, you don't need too much of that stuff. I, that's a little exaggerated. No, we don't go enough, we don't spend enough time in a place where you get hot. Amen, church. Oh, I tell you, the average Baptist. Bible believing Baptists don't know anything about the enemy. You know, who, you know who the world thinks the enemy is? They think the enemy is Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you this morning the Lord Jesus Christ is not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. Amen. He's public enemy number one. And his emissaries, his principalities, his work, rulers of darkness, how uh, they'll do anything they can if there's ever a fire getting lit to hinder you. Every time we have a Bible conference, I have no doubt. The intensity of stress. Whew. Say, why is that? Because somebody's trying to kindle a fire. You need to expect it. And just pray, God, help me. Put, put on the whole armor of God. Protect me from uh, the hindrance that the devil or the, the flesh or the world would try to get me so I, I stay on fire. Amen, church. Amen. Ah. Oh, I remember years ago reading... Uh, President George Bush's biography. And, and uh, I was reading about what he had to say about Guantanamo Bay. And he said, do you know what the most read book in Guantanamo Bay is? These are the top terrorists of all the world. You'd think it'd be an occult or the Quran or maybe other books like that that would be against Christianity. But you know what the number one book was in the Quran during George Bush's... It was Harry Potter. What in the deal? Why would people want to read about a witch and his witch and Aries or whatever they are? The occult. So popular. Folks, I'm telling you what, I know sometimes Hollywood can make things a little entertaining and make it seem harmless, but I'm here to tell you the occult is not harmless. Their goal is to deceive you and to cause you not to be saved. And if you are saved, the last thing they want a saved person to do is to live for God and to serve God and to love God. And so they'll try to latch on to you and keep you from being around people that are fired up. Amen. That's exactly what they'll do. Oh, I tell you. There's a lot of folks today that are wet and cold and they're dried up and they're dead. And you know what they need? They need the, fi the, 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 the flame, the, the fans to flame the Word of God when it's preached and it goes out from this pulpit and sitting on your lap to just kind of radiate some heat in your heart towards God. Boy, that would be so good. 
Amen. The dangers of kindling a fire. And what happens is, you see another thing here is, uh, the Bible says it fastened on his hand. That snake was on Paul's hand. And he's no young fella. I don't think he was on blood thinner. Or he'd have bled to death. You know how that is. That's so difficult. So many people taking blood thinner. And, and it's difficult when you hurt yourself. And that old snake. And, and you know what they thought? They thought, <laughs> the attitude is, they said, oh, he must be a murderer because he's got a snake on his hands. And when he shakes the, the snake off, next thing he said, he's a god. How fickle people are on you about fired up and not fired up. But you know what happens? I, I want to take this thought for a few seconds, if you'll allow me a little liberty. When you get something that bites you, you can allow that to go to seed. And before you know it, the rest of your life, you're, you're just uh, defeated because you say, I, I got bit. Serving God, kindling the fire, and I tell you, I got a boo-boo, and it, 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 it ain't fair, and it ain't right. I, I didn't deserve this. I'm trying to do right. And I, you see my boo-boo, and you talk to people, and all they talk about is their boo-boo when they got hurt. Everybody in here is hurting. Everybody in here is hurting. You say, the preacher's hurting? You, you just don't want to know. That's my dear wife. she tell you. I'm a nutcase. You think I'm joking? When you try to serve God, it is absolute battle just to get to the pulpit and say what God wants you to say without all the distractions. I'm not poor me, I'm not saying that, but everybody's got, Bob, you know what Paul said? He said in 1 Corinthians, that great chapter, he said, oh, this is a great verse. He said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. It's okay for a child to have a boo-boo. Natural for a baby to say, no, oh, I hurt myself. I've got them grandbabies. I told you, I don't know what to do with them. And they come up, that girl comes up to me, and I said, what's the matter with you? Oh. I said, what's wrong with you, girl? I don't understand girl talk. Oh. She said, I got a boo-boo. I said, where is it? And she'll show me, and ain't nothing wrong with that girl. But she wants, mm, Papa loves you, and you'll be okay. Oh. And I love to do that for her, because I, I, and them girls just, they're just sweet, but you don't know what to do with them. We got some older girls in Rice's Valley this morning. I tell you what, I don't know what to do with you guys, gals. You've got boo boos. Amen. You got you got issues. I'm getting in trouble right now. I need to bow heads and close eyes and let's come to the altar. Amen. Oh my goodness. But when you get a little older, he says this. Uh, but I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Come on now. When you start getting a little older and a little more mature. You say, man, that's just to be expected. If you're going to live for Christ, you're going to get it in the knack. If you're going to live for Christ, you're going to have opposition. You're going to have hurt. You're going to have problems. It's just suffering for Christ, and we need to bear it a little bit. Otherwise, we spend 20 years later saying, you know what happened to me, Dana? I've been a pastor a long time. I've got some folks left church because I didn't shake their hand, and I didn't know it didn't. You say, nobody would leave Rice's Valley. Uh -huh. You know why most churches spend most of their time not preaching? They're recognizing everybody's there so they don't miss anybody in case somebody gets missed and then they leave and say, I did not recognize me. I'm not here to recognize you. I'm here to honor the Lord. We're glad you're here. Thank God you're here. Amen. But it's not about you. It's about Him. And we need Him to stir us and to help us and to fire us up. Amen. God being our helper. I can't fire you up. It's in a pep rally. I'm not going rah, rah, rah. Roll, roll, tide. I, I mean, I enjoy some of that stuff. It's silly. It's fun. Until we lose. And then I have a problem. We all burn people in our church. I'm just joking. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's amazing what upsets us when something bothers us. When you get called out at work, do you quit and say, I'm not going back to there no more. They don't appreciate me. No, you, you, you suck it up and you go to work and you make a living and you take care of your responsibility. When the preacher gets all over you, you say, I tell you, the preacher's picking on me. Not enough. Not enough. People say, who are you preaching to? I'm preaching to everybody in the building. People say, he's preaching directly to me. You get that right. If I missed you, then I missed you. And I messed up, I'll pick you on you the next time. I'll say, I'll go down. I remember one time I was preaching revival up in Brooklyn and in Hueytown, Alabama, and I, I was younger then. I'd go down the aisles. I'd be all over the place. Didn't have the, I don't have that energy anymore to go anywhere. 
But I remember going down, Brother Doug was sitting, I grabbed an old boy and I was preaching to him and I said, you need to, you need to love God, need to do right, you need to get right. He was an old deacon that got out of church and been gone for years and he'd just come in with the family. I didn't know it. I was in his face. And I turned around, come back to the altar and he followed me to the altar to get right with God. His whole family came to the altar and they're all down there praying. I said, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I was just trying to preach to everybody. If you don't think you need fired up, you need fired up. Oh, dear church. And you know what? It's easy to have problems. It's absolutely pitiful in 2023 how easily the average Baptist church has been saved for years, but the slightest little thing offends them. You know what the old adage is? It ought to be like a duck off, you know, water off a duck's back. Just let it go. That's one good thing about frozen. Amen? I've heard that story. Good. Now, let it go. Let it go. It works good on this message, you know. It's good doctrine right there. Some of us need to let some things go. But some people don't know how to let it go. They carry it for years and years. That preacher, he preached at me. Or that, that baby in the nursery bit my child. Yeah, I get that. I know how that works. I, I, I mean, you know how people are. Get your feelings hurt. I'm here to tell you, church, just be prepared. You're going to get your feelings hurt if you're going to love Jesus. It's part of it. But you know what you need to do? You don't need to say, I'm going to carry this snake around as a testament of my toughness. No. Look what Paul did. I love this. In verse number, oh, it's so simple. In verse number five, he shook it off. He shook it off. You know what some of you need to do this morning? you got some things that have been hurting you, some things that have been bothering you, some things that have been just stealing your opportunity to be able to be fired up for God. And you know what you need to do? You need to come to this old altar or make an altar where you're sitting and just shake it off and say, God, I'm done with that. Get off me. Plead the blood. Pray for God to forgive you and, and just shake it off. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of things that God will just take from you if you'll let him. Ask him to help you, would you? It may take more than one trip to the altar, just like it takes more than one time to light a fire. But you keep taking it to God and say, God, take it from me. I plead the blood. Please help me. And Paul did. And you know what I love about the Apostle Paul? He's such an example of humility. He didn't walk around and get a big head because he'd been bit by the snake, which normally happens to swell. Look what it says there in our text. It says in verse 6, How be it? They looked when he should have swollen and fallen down dead suddenly. But after that, he looked a great while and they saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds. Paul didn't get swollen. He humbled himself. Folks, I'm here to tell you, if we're ever going to get fired up for God, it's going to be more about Jesus and less about us. We're not going to get the big head. I don't know how anybody's got a big head in 2023. As if they're God's gift. No. If anybody was God's gift, it was Paul. What an example he was when fires are kindled and you respond right. Dear church, would you respond right to, to the need of the hour? I know many are, have gotten cold and, and got a little indifferent and maybe they've just gotten just a little disheartened. Oh, folks, we need to kindle a fire. Preacher's trying to just get a fire lit. I'm not talking about wildfire. I'm not talking about strange fire. I'm not talking about just out of control. I'm talking about God renewing in us a zeal for the, the family and the church and the Bible and souls and, 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 and the rapture and, and revival. Coming like we say, God's going to do something this week. You believe it's able? I believe he's able. I do. Oh, John Wesley again. He said, if I had 300 men who feared nothing but God and hated nothing but sin and were determined to know nothing among men but Jesus Christ and him crucified, he said, I could set the world on fire for God. How come, how come we don't hear that much? Getting on fire for God. Oh, dear church. Uh, could you handle a little kindling today? Could you handle a little fire? I like this song. We sing it every once in a while. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me. Let your voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness. In this day and hour, I will be your witness. Here's the thing. Fill me with thy power. 
Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Do we have that in the songbook? We don't have it. Well, we'll sing another one. Set my soul afire, Lord, for the lost in sin. Boy, somebody needs to have a burden for lost people. Give to me a passion as I seek to win. Help me not to falter. Never let me fail. Fill me with thy spirit. Let thy will prevail. Together, church. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Let's stand together with heads bowed. The piano's going to play something, and we're going to have a chance to just talk to God before the service is concluded in just a minute. Would you ask God to set your soul afire? Help them to be concerned about souls. Help them be concerned about your family. Help them be concerned about your faith and your Bible. Your country. The souls around the world. God knows somebody needs to be fired up about reaching souls. Our grandchildren. Our, our young, our, our, bo our daughters and our sons. Our next generation of leaders. God help us to get a stirring in us that has a burden to set our souls afire. Would you pray, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you'd like to come to the altar, please do. If you'd like to pray, we are, please do. If you're watching by means of the broadcast, we pray that God will stir you and help you uh, to just love God and do right. Just a season of prayer and we'll be done. If you're here today and you're not saved, you don't know Christ as your Savior, Oh, I tell you what, God can kindle a fire in your heart, change you and save you and give you a new, a new creature in Christ Jesus, give you eternal life. If you'll come to God on His terms, that you're a sinner and God died for sinners, He died on the cross to forgive you. If you'll come to Him and believe what He did on the cross for your sins, ask Him to come into your heart, He'll forgive you, He'll save you. Say, Lord Jesus, save me today and wash me in your blood. Uh, that'll work. That'll work if you're lost. Don't leave lost. Don't watch lost. Sixty-six in the red, please. Love this song. It's a great prayer. It'll help you every time. We'll sing the first and last and then ask God to help us. Please, church. Verse number one. Search me, O God, and know my heart today try me oh 
Savior. No, my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin. We'll sing verse number four, and how true it is. It's the Holy Ghost that'll help us. Verse number four. Oh, Holy Ghost, revival comes from the none else. He's the reviver. Send a revival. Start the work in me. Thy word declares Thou wilt supply our need for blessings now O Lord and God's people said Amen. Amen we appreciate God's word and how he desires to help us and I'm glad that he still can Hadn't gave up on us or we'd be in heaven or the rapture would happen. So you be praying now for this next week. You be in your place. Be with us. Come. Get some help. And we'll be, and be praying for the meeting. And be praying for God to work. Please. And we'll be so thankful. Good to have Brother Stephen Murphy with us. Him and his dear wife. Uh, would you please ask God to dismiss us in prayer, please. Thank you.